Good evening, good evening, good evening. We're back. Round two. Hope everybody's doing well. It's good to have you here. We're uh, talking about about ICX tonight. So today we went through a number of things. I'm going to show you how to manage these things. I'm going to answer a lot of the questions that came through. Um, everybody that reached out last week and throughout this week as well, thank you. It's always good to have that feedback, and it's it's great to get your your ideas. Um, I'm also going to let you guys play DJ. So if you want. A different playlist or something a little more mellow let me know i'll be sure to to turn that on as well so we talked about icx and we're going to continue to talk about icx and uh you'll have to ignore i think nightbot's asleep so i'm trying to trigger it to get it to send commands out because it's on timers but it's not behaving <laughs> i don't know why so i'm gonna just let it do its thing uh felix hello welcome good to have you here so the icx in the house it's uh it's a great tool to have. It's very powerful. We can do a lot of things with it. Um, but it can also cause some problems if we're not really careful with it and what it's doing. Um, so I'm going to teach you about all of that. I'm going to give you some info, some insight, and I'm going to help you get into this thing all the time uh, so that you never lose access to it. So I've got a couple questions I wanted to run through. Um, you know, the first one is, can you remotely manage this or do I have to have a cable that I plug into the into the device and then plug that into my laptop and get into the console? No, we can remotely manage this. From within your house, can you do it outside of your house? Mm, yes, but it's very technical and it's very complicated for most uses. You don't really need to. Um, you don't want to expose this device to the public internet. It, it's not smart basically um, you can you have to do a lot of different security measures to do that for home applications I don't recommend it it's you know your IP address space that you have within your house that your cable or DSL modem is providing to all of your de devices is private IP space so it doesn't route on the internet you can't get to it from anywhere else so I wouldn't expose it to the internet if you have a special use case you can um, and if you do have a special use case you probably have additional hardware in your house firewalls, things like that, that allow you to do that. Um, and if you need information on that, I'm more than happy to provide it. But uh, for this general use case, I wouldn't do it. Okay. Um, another question we got was surrounding DNS and, and DHCP. So do we need to do anything on the ICX itself to provide DHCP? I'll cover that piece first. My recommendation would be no. And not only no, I wouldn't recommend doing it because it will cause problems. Your cable modem or your DSL modem is configured to provide your IP addresses to all your devices. So just let it do it. There's no harm in doing that. Um, also on top of that, your unleashed access points, I wouldn't allow them to provide IP addresses either. You're gonna end up with conflicts and the DSL modems and the cable modems aren't they're not built to be able to configure that really. So avoid that at all costs if you can. In terms of DNS, DNS is just your domain name look uh, domain name lookup. So when you go to a browser and you type google.com or youtube.com, it translates that to an IP address. The ICXs don't have to have that configured. If you configure DNS lookups inside the ICX itself, all that's gonna do is if you type traceroutgoogle.com into the command line of your ICX, It'll do that translation, it'll go out and find it. It doesn't do anything for your clients. So your your wired wireless devices, anything like that, it's not gonna help. So no, you don't need DHCP or DNS configs in your ICX, so it makes it really simple. In fact, the, the configuration that you need on your ICX in your house is about as bare bones simple as you really need. You need it to be online, you need to have power, you need it to have power turned on on the ports and you need an IP address on it. And for most applications, that's really all you need. Okay. Um, ISP challenges. What are some of the things you can face with that? Here and there, you'll find this. So typically when you're doing streaming 
and you're watching Netflix or Hulu or whatever service you're using, you're receiving that data. So you don't have to make any modifications. Um, now, if you're uploading a lot of traffic, like I would be right now because I'm sending a stream out, providers tend to look at that and, and wonder what's going on because typical use case, if you're watching YouTube, if you're you know downloading files, if you're streaming content, you're downloading that. And so that's why when you do speed tests, you see that your download speed's really high, but your upload speed is less than that, usually half to a quarter. That's because we don't upload as much as we download. Um, now, that said, if you are a gamer or you have kids in the house that game and they're using an Xbox or a PlayStation or even a PC, we have seen times where you need to enable port forwarding in your provider's modem. Um, that just allows those ports to go out and connect really depends on the type of gaming that they're doing. Some things require it, some don't. And we've actually seen large improvements in the DSL modems and the cable modems over time that have really helped enable that on the fly so you don't have to worry about it. So it's something to look at if you have older uh, provider hardware, you can look at that stuff, but typically you don't really have to worry about it, okay? Uh, one other thing that kind of goes into that is I typically, some of my friends have run into this, and it's not going to be a very common thing uh, for most of us, just because we're not we're not really pushing the limits of what we're doing on our on our internet links, so we don't have to worry about it. But I have seen throttling happen, and that happens when you're uploading a lot of content. So I'm probably guilty of this at home. At times, there's times where I'm uploading content, but it's mainly for work. So if I'm moving files around, you'll see those uploads, and sometimes they'll throttle that not very often um, it's really not that big of a deal so you don't see it as much but we talked about this last week and I just want to reiterate this you know your provider sells you an internet speed and they typically come to your house or call you and say hey we'll sell you giganet or gigabit ethernet or gigabit internet whatever one it is and you get it and you get it installed and you're connected to your Wi-Fi and you go out and you do a speed test right away and it shows you everything but gig internet speed and that's to be expected. So just because you were sold gig internet does not mean that's the speed you're going to get. In fact, the access points that you have in your house, if you put them in a completely clean, pristine environment, no other Wi-Fi signals around, no interference, no noise, nothing. You got a perfect connection to it. Your client will only transmit to that thing at 867 megabits per second. So even the access point, the clients can't handle that. Now, keep in mind, if you're streaming video and Netflix, YouTube, all of that video content is compressed so that it streams well, so it doesn't buffer, so you don't run into issues like that. If you were streaming 4K video, which is the highest, most pristine video signal you can get, to stream that, you need a pipe of 25 megabits per second. That's it. <laughs> so when you see a four or 500 megabit per second uh, speed test, Fear not. It's everything you're trying to do will work perfectly fine. Okay. Um, I did get some questions about AAA. And AAA is authentication, authorization, and accounting. Home applications, you don't really run into that a lot. It's not something that you need to worry about. Um, it, it basically allows you to authenticate credentials against the device using attack X server, using LDAP radius, things like that. Uh, the accounting allows you to track and audit changes that were made in it. That, that stuff is really designed for more work environments where you have a lot of networking equipment and you wanna have audit trails on that, but you also wanna be able to set configuration parameters that says all of these employees can log into this stuff based on their credentials but it keeps your configuration really small. Home applications, you don't have to really worry about that. And on top of that, this is something we will go into this stuff in later streams. So starting next week, we're gonna go back to one stream per day. So it'll just be um, 11 a.m. Mountain on Wednesday. But we're gonna start taking the entire Ruckus portfolio and we're gonna build this out and we're gonna build the whole entire portfolio. So we're gonna start with zone director and move access points into smart zone. And then we're gonna to start to tie ICXs in it. And eventually we'll do some crazy stuff with ICX like MCT and, and stacking and switch port extenders and things like that. So we're really gonna build on these solutions and put them together so you can see them. So AAA and things like that, 
we'll come into it. And especially on the, the smart zone side, we'll have a lot of, um, you know, LDAP authentication and dynamic VLANs and things like that. So look forward to that. That's what's coming up. And again, if you guys are, are sending notes into ruckus live at comscope.com, we'll take that. And if we need to just kind of insert a ruckus at home live stream in there again because of changes or things like that, I will absolutely do it. There's no set schedule. Um, it's just really a way for us to get information out to you. Okay. Richard has a question. So I use Ruckus Cloud on a client with the R650 here. That's an awesome AP, Richard. And the result has been wonderful. Great. I've used a separate router to make layer two and it has worked well. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So separating those out makes it super simple and super clean. And I'm sure that that R5 or that R650 is probably uh, helping out a lot too. So I'm glad to hear that. Thanks. And uh, if there's anything we can help answer that, we, you know, we will do some ruckus cloud live streams as well. I know cloud is a, is a great platform and it, it really makes things super simple for you as well. So great. Thanks for that feedback. I, I love hearing that. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you the full rundown of what we're going to do. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, this is full disclosure time, okay? So I'm going to show you what I have here. This is the equipment I have. So I have um, two 7150s, and I'll explain why in a minute. I have an Aero surfboard on top of it. That's a cable modem. That's if anybody has questions or confusion about how you actually connect this thing to your ICX, I can show you because there are multiple um, Ethernet ports on these guys. I want to make sure you know right where it goes. Um, but we're going to enable this thing to be remotely managed and we're going to do it in a way to where we know what it is, right? So I'm going to start with this guy. Now, the problem is the way that the network is built here. I couldn't tie this thing into the network without causing some headache and, and running the risk of maybe possibly causing some problems. Okay. And I didn't want to do that. So I'm going to demonstrate how to do all of this on this hardware. The ICX that you see behind it, that's back in the corner, that one's configured to allow remote access to it, to allow the web UI management to it. So I'll be able to demonstrate exactly what this stuff is, how it's working, things like that. Okay, so we'll not only configure it, and I'll show you that in a demonstration purpose, we'll go ahead and, and give you an example. So I'm gonna cover Telnet, um, I'm gonna cover SSH, I'm gonna talk about the differences between them, I'm gonna cover how to turn web management on, um, and why that's a good thing or a bad thing depending on the environment. And then we've also seen some traction in the forums. So I wish I could get Nightbot to wake up because the forums link is awesome to have. Maybe this will wake him up. I don't know. Um, there's a ton of conversation going on in there and there's a ton of contributors that sit down and actually sit down and work the problem with you. And the, the great thing about that is if somebody from Ruckus isn't there to answer right away, another member of the community will jump in that's seen it before, dealt with it. You can get a ton of information in there. And one thing I saw recently was some folks that have ICXs in their house have ran into issues where they ran out of ports. <laughs> so their access points are plugged in, their TVs are plugged in, their computers are plugged in, everybody's stuck at home and they ran out of port density. So the reason why we're gonna do the stacking is because if you come across a second 7150 of the same model, the same type, you can you can stack them together. They will act as one device. Makes it super simple and easy. The other option is if you're really out of ports and you need to expand, there's a ICX 7150-24P, that's the model. It's a copper interface port or a form factor just like this. Everything will plug into it. And the nice thing is, is it will do the exact same thing that this 7150 is doing. It runs the exact same software. So that makes it super easy. It'll provide power. It will provide all the connectivity that you have. It does the same thing. So you'll be good to go. Hey, Andrew, welcome. Let's see. Thank you for your help last week. You bet. Um, I got the AP powered up, programming the ICX using serial, etc. Now my AP has amber lights for the 5G and 2.4 gig. Hey, you know what? That's good. So let me show you the camera. The reason why those lights are amber, I don't know if you can see this. Pull my mic over here. See how mine are green? You know why that is? That's because there are no clients attached to it. Now watch this. I'm gonna jump on my phone. 
and I'm going to connect to it. And what you're going to see Oh, I just fibbed. This thing is connected to it. Why is it showing green? It should show. Oh, Amber, that's because you don't have. What does that light mean? Hold on a second. I'm going to stick my foot in my mouth if I'm not careful. Amber, I thought meant that there were clients attached and green meant that there weren't. But let's verify real quick. And I'm going to go to Dr. Google and make sure. Let's make sense. Like hundred percent certain here. Okay, if it's green, no, that's power. We need two point four and five. Okay, green means that the radio is up. At least one client is connected. If it's amber, it means the radio is up and no clients are connected. So I misspoke. I was just backwards or dyslexic or whatever we want to call it. So that means you're not connected to it. So Andrew, my question would be, the the cable provider, your DSL modem, it probably has a Wi-Fi. Uh, capability inside of it. Are you sure you're not connected to the cable modems Wi-Fi versus the Unleashed network? And there's, I'm assuming it didn't come up um, reset. It may have. If it did, that's a super simple fix. Go to your device, go look at your Wi-Fi networks and just look and see if you have one that's called configure.me. And if you do, then that's what it is. The, the main problem I have is I'm not 100% sure. And uh, maybe if we're lucky, somebody from supports in here and they can help us, it might possibly mean that it was completely reset. And if it is, getting it set back up is super simple. But just look for that configure.me uh, SSID and we'll get that thing set up for you. That's easy to do. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Sure. Yeah, I'll have to check. I don't know if we have anybody from support here, but we will take a look at that. And depending on how it's behaving, we'll get you taken care of. Oh, you weren't able to get that to come up. Okay. Let's see here. Um, yeah, search for that configure.me SSID if it's not there. How many access points do you have in your house? One or two? And then I'll help you with that. And at worst case, we'll just reset it. And then you can get that thing fired back up. Oh, and you got the IP for the switch. Okay. If the APs are powered, you should be done with the switch now. You don't have to get back into it. And you have one AP. Perfect. Okay. Um, we can do a hard reset on it, and you can set it up from scratch if you want. Is it attached to the ceiling, or is it just sitting on a desk or on a table or something somewhere? That'll make things a little bit easier. Because, excuse me, either way, you're going to need either the key that came with it, or you're going to need a paper clip. <laughs> <laughs> it's really that ceiling. Okay. If it's on the ceiling, grab a chair, a ladder, whatever you need um, that can get you up to where you can see the back of it where the cable plugs into it. And let me show you. Um, Richard, give me two seconds. I'm gonna I'm gonna help him with this and then I'll get to your to your question here. All right. Oh, hopefully you can see that. I know that's a little bit far away. Okay, yep, that reset button. There's a reset button back there. Um, stick it in there, but hold the button down for about 10 seconds. The power light will turn red. Just hold it there for 10 seconds and then let go of it. Sometimes you have to do this multiple times. Okay, yep, do that. See if we can get it reset. We'll see if we can get that configure me SSID going and then we'll just do a complete reset on it and you'll be set to go. Okay. And I can reset mine and we can do it again. I'm, there's nothing on mine of importance. So I use it for the live streams. I don't use it for anything else. So we can run by that example for sure. So try that. Hold it for about 10 seconds. Power button will go red and then we'll see if we can get it going. Okay. Let me know. Richard, uh, about question related to PoE design when it comes to ICX switches. We know that the intermediate Wi Fi 6 has a reasonable power consumption. Is there a poor implementation of PoE designed by vendors? There's a history of it. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna self promote something here, and that's some of the people that I work with internally. We had issues with PoE in the past. Okay, and the PoE issues were with a chipset. So there was a long list of people that worked on these, 
And there were issues, and there were issues across the board, across the landscape within. All vendors had issues with this. Um, we have since resolved those. And one thing to keep in mind with this, when we resolved it, we took very, very special care to make sure that it was resolved correctly. I'm not self-touting this. I'm actually extremely proud of the team that did this because this is a problem that I had faced previously. So I had dealt with it. So they, they worked very hard to correct it. And it's corrected now. So the, the R650 that you have, I need to see. Um, let me pull the data sheet real quick, Richard. And I'm going to see what the power draw is on that because it's not too much for the 7150. I can tell you that much right now. Um, if the data sheet will load, stand by. Let me find the power draw. It's max power consumption is 12.5 watts, okay? So, let's look at this. If I look at this ICX that we have right here, okay? And I do a show inline power. We can see that this thing will provide up to 124 watts of power, okay? So, you can plug in 10 of them not safely. <laughs> you could probably plug in eight of them safely before you got full on consumption uh, consumed of power on the device. Okay, so that has been very much corrected. And the ICX, if you have a 7150C12P like the white ones I'm showing you in your house, they're, they're resolved. So our chipsets, everything, firmware is set, it's good to go. Now the one thing you can do is as software is released and if you're running say 8060 or 8070 you can jump to 8090 and get that software um, that will actually provide a poe firmware update which also gives you some additional stability in that environment so that's another option there as well um, just to do firmware updates and firmware just helps with the chipsets in there but everything has been rock solid so if you have problems try that that's a, a very good thing to try okay all right, we're going to, while Andrew's resetting that thing, I'm gonna do some work in here. I'm gonna show you how to get Telnet set up, okay? And we're gonna do Telnet, and we're gonna do super user passwords and things like that. So when you first get into the console of these guys, you're gonna have a prompt that looks like this, and it's the carrot. This is called user exec mode. And what this means is you can do show commands, you can limited show commands, you can show certain things but you can't see everything, okay? Um, and you certainly cannot enter config mode, so you can't make changes in this mode. And typically what we do to enter the mode, the privilege mode that we want is we type enable, okay? Well, you can password protect that as well. So we can set two passwords, one just to get into the device and then one to enter enable. And most commonly that's what you would do. Um, what I would recommend is, especially if you have kids in the house that are starting to take interest in technology and things like that, I would password protect this just to make sure that you don't end up with something really goofy going on in your network that you don't know about. Um, or it may be a good learning tool if you're, you know, watching over, the, over their shoulder and things like that. So turning on Telnet is pretty easy. So one thing I want to point out as you look at this thing, there's no config on this guy. I mean, it pulled an IP address. This IP address that pulled, it pulled from the cable modem that I plugged into it. You're never going to know what this IP address is unless you have console access to get you into it. Andrew can speak to that. He fought with this last week. So he had to go buy a cable, get plugged into it, got the IP address of it. And now he'll be able to set a static IP address on it so he can get back into it whenever he needs to. Okay. So this is typically, typically what's going to happen. I'm not a fan of letting... My router switches, um, even my access points, I don't, but I do this for a living. I don't like having them automatically pulling IP addresses. I'm just not a fan of it. Um, I wanna know what the IP address is. <laughs> so as Andrew just confirmed. So we're gonna, we're gonna statically set it. So first thing we have to do, if you look right here, it says no Telnet server. That means I can't Telnet into this. It's turned off by default. Now in this version, um, Telnet's off by default, SSH is on by default, but you still have to have the IP address, okay? And I'm gonna show you how to turn Telnet on and then also how to enable SSH if it's not. Because in most of the, the homeowner applications, 
you're running software that didn't automatically turn SSH on, okay? So, what do we do? We have to enter config mode. So that's configure, and you can type part of it and then tab over and it'll finish it. Terminal, you can also shorten this. So I could type config space T and enter and it'll work, okay? And all I'm gonna type is telnet server, okay? That's it. So if you noticed how that command was there a minute ago, now it's gone. So now show telnet, it'll show that the server status is enabled, okay? That means I can also telnet to this now if I need to. Now, should you use telnet at home on your private network that isn't really a security risk? Sure, I mean, why not? Typically, I would tell people do not use telnet ever again for the history of history <laughs> because it's insecure. It's the most insecure method out there. And I'll show you why this matters because when, you, when I send these commands to this device, over a telnet session, they happen in plain text. Well, guess what? If I do this, and now I have to create a username of Matt, and I'm gonna create a password of Ruckus, and I hit enter, that command is sent to it, clear text. So if anybody's sniffing the wire, if they're stealing your packets, if there's a man in the middle, they have your password, okay? If we configure SSH, which is what you should do, all of that information is encrypted. So if they're sitting there watching that traffic, they're just gonna see encrypted traffic. Okay. So how do we do that? Turning on SSH is pretty easy. Uh, you have to do a crypto command. We do crypto key. And there's two things we can do here. You can either generate one or you can zeroize one. Uh, zeroizing it is usually if you have keys that get botched up between clients and servers. Um, or if you just want to reset it from scratch because it was somebody else's at one point, you can do it that way as well. We're going to do a generate because I want to generate one. Okay? So you generate it. It's there. It'll take a second. Watch, this will be the Windows 95 blue screen. Nope, it worked. Okay, so now I can do show SSH. SSH server status is enabled, it's there. I just did a show who to see who was connected to it. Okay, all right, hey Walter, welcome. Uh, hey Matt, I have two R600 APs and an ICX7150-24. Awesome, you got a lot of ports. I have a lot of IoT devices that I wanna put on a separate VLAN. Can you cover at some point how to configure VLANs on the AP and ICX? Absolutely, I would love to. And I would also highly recommend doing that. So my first question for you with that is, do you have a physical hardware SG1100 or other model of NetGate PFSense or are you doing it in VMware? Because that's gonna matter because you also have to configure your VLANs in PFSense. And I do this at home, I have friends that do this at home and it's a little involved and all full disclosure, whoever wrote the switching software in PFSense did not consult with a switching expert when they wrote that. It's very, very confusing. But I can walk through how to do the ICX piece of it and the um, access point piece of it, piece of cake. The PFSense piece of it, you're gonna have to do some Google in there to figure out how you need to configure yours with, oh, sorry, with your uh, with your VLANs. But I'll show you for sure. Let me go through the remote access part and then I'll actually show you how to break that out, okay? Oh, and side note, the 7150 has to be running router code um, well, it doesn't have to. Um, okay, you're using physical. Okay, perfect. That's fine. I can show you how to do that. And if you're using um, physical do-it-yourself, it's probably running on a bare metal server piece of cake because they don't... They didn't muck up the, the switching piece of it on the software VM side of it like they did on the hardware side. And not muck up. They just made it really confusing. Okay. No lights at all. So Andrew, if you go, I don't know if you're on your phone or if you're on your laptop, but if you start searching and see if you can find that, it'll just show up as a configure.me SSID. Um, it's gotta be in there somewhere, hopefully. If not, look for one that says recover.me. 
Uh, Walter, you know what I would do? Honestly, man, I, I don't run switch code personally. I, I'm not a fan of it. And I'm, the only reason I'm not a fan of it is because I come from more of a routing background than a switching background. Running router code in an ICX is mostly beneficial because you can do so much more. You can create VE interfaces, which are VLAN interfaces for your VLANs. Um, you can enable things like routing protocols, OSPF, BGP, um, ISIS if you wanted to, RIP if you really needed to, um, access lists, things like that. It gets you so much more functionality in the device by just running a separate software type. That's, that's really it. So I would recommend router code at all times. Um, and a lot of peers that I have within the, within the industry, they recommend the same thing. Run router code everywhere you can. There's no security flaws with it. There's no massive difference. There's no change in the CLI whatsoever. And the ICX that you're looking at right here, running router code. Okay. All right, one more thing. I'm gonna, tr I'm gonna show you how to turn the web UI on. Um, this is mainly beneficial for home use. So I would, n I would never use this. I've used the web UI on, an, on a router or a switch probably three times in my entire life. And the third time was today in the first live stream. So this is number four. You get to be witness to history. And this will probably be the only time I do it. Just, I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying I come from, you bet, Walter. I come from using a CLI to do this. So web interfaces to me are not as friendly as the CLI. I know what I'm doing in the CLI. In the web interface, I'm clicking around trying to find stuff. I can configure the CLI fine. Now in the house, it's super simple because if you need stats, pictures, anything, you can do that. So it's really easy to do. You just enter config mode again. You type web management and we're gonna do uh, HTTP. That's it. It's on, boom, done. See you later. Thanks for playing. <laughs> okay. All right. Now we need to put an IP address on this and I put IP addresses in VE interfaces. Other options are you can put IP addresses on loopback interfaces as long as it's within the same subnet that you have um, in your house. So like we just showed, if I do a show IP interface on this guy, um, show me that. Oh, it killed the dynamic address. Oh, I unplugged it. That's why. <laughs> okay, I'm not losing it. So it pulled that 192.168.100. whatever address space, right? There are typically in every single cable modem or DSL router that you get, you're going to get 254 usable IP addresses that you can use in that address space. That's a lot. All we have to do is we just have to find one that we can use, okay? And to do that, we're gonna use our command prompt. And I'm gonna type IP config, okay? And I'm gonna see what my IP address is. So this is the IP space that we use here. Um, it's, a, it's a larger subnet mask, so ignore that. But the things you're concerned with would be the IP address and the subnet mask, because when you configure this in the ICX, you need those, okay? So I need to find one. I need to use one that's available. I know that the IP address on the ICX I'm gonna telnet to or SSH to or web into is 95.95. .95. So if I ping that one, because I wanna use it, it's gonna show me that it's alive. Okay. But if I go to say 95.200, it's not working. Destination host unreachable. That means nothing is using that IP address. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's safe for me to use that. So I can say, okay, I'm gonna configure this guy. So how do we do that? Well, for me, like I said, you, oh, did this thing come back up in, oh, it's, it's router code, Never mind. Okay. Like I said, you can do this on a loopback interface. I'm actually gonna do it on the VLAN. So I'm gonna do a config T and I'm gonna type VLAN one, okay? Every single port in this device is on VLAN one if you haven't specifically changed it. Um, it's odd how it does that, but, no, it's not odd, sorry. I, got, I was reading chat and I got sidetracked. That's the default VLAN. Every single port belongs to VLAN one until you move it to another port, okay? Well, we're not gonna do that. So then VLAN one, I need to create an interface 
for this. So I'm going to do router dash interface VE1. Now, the reason I'm using one, this is cosmetic. I could set it to 100 if I wanted to. I don't recommend doing that. Ah, this TFTP thing is killing me. I want it to match and I'll show you why. It makes it so much easier to troubleshoot this stuff later. IP routing verf, IG pulse, route only. Was configured. What? Nothing's configured on that port. Oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> I have to take this address off real quick. Ignore that. You won't see that. Oh, it's stuck on the command prompt. I'm sorry. Thanks, Adolf. Appreciate that. There we go. You didn't see the mistake anyway, so I, I dodged a bullet. <laughs> All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to make our router interface match our VLAN number. Okay. So config T VLAN one. Oh, you still can't see that. Hang on. It's cutting it off on the screen. Technical difficulties. Always. All right. There we go. Config T VLAN one now router dash interface VE one. Okay. My VE interface number matches my VLAN number. So perfect. And a lot of this is I'm really nitpicky about that stuff. I believe in standards and, and best practices and things like that. So now I know if I'm looking at VE one, it relates to VLAN one. I know that that's where everything lives there. Okay. So now we have the router interface configured. Okay. It's specified here and it's referenced lower in the config. It's there. We just need an IP address on it. So let's put one on there. Okay. IP address 192.168.95. I'm going to use 95. It won't affect anything. I just want this to match what I'm going to do in a minute. And then you can use the CIDR notation of the subnet mask. If you know what those are, that would work. If you don't know what it is, remember I showed you in the IP config how to find that. 255, we use a different subnet mask here. There we go. Okay. Now the most important command in the history of ICX ever is this one, right? Memory. Every time you make a change in these guys, perform a right memory. If you make a change and it locks it up, reboot it, it'll go back to the config that was there before. They use NVRAM, non-volatile RAM. So there's a running config that we're looking at now, and there's a startup config. And that startup config is what the ICX will boot up and load for its config. As we make changes, we make changes to the running config. We have to save that and copy it into the startup config. That's what write memory does. Okay. You can make it more complicated. You can do a copy run. Oh, you can't do it in here. I guess that's a <clears throat> competitor command. Okay. So there you go. That's how you make permanent changes, right? Memory. You can also do it in the web UI and I'll show you how to do that in a second. Okay. That's the number one thing I can tell you. It's, it's bit me before and it's definitely saved me before because <laughs> I made a change and locked myself out of something. And then I just pull the power cord and plug it back in, comes back up and I can do the command correctly. Okay. All right. Oh, enable. We need to show you how to set an enable password. So remember when I told you that when you type, um, Enable, there should be a password there. Well, we don't have one. So what you do is you do config T, enable super user password, and then you enter the password. So we're gonna do ruckus, okay? Now, even though this is typed in in clear text, when you look at the configuration, it won't show up. It just shows up as dots, okay? And that's for privacy, it'll hide it. You won't ever see it. All right. What do you guys think? Should we jump into this thing and take a look at it? I think so. All right. I'm going to change things up a little bit here. I go here. Oh, that's my command prompt. Hold on. Putty. We're going to do a new session. And we're going to use SSH to connect to our ICX, which we just configured. Oh. It didn't work. <laughs> Hang on a second. 
I'm just telling it to it for example sake right now. That did work, okay. Let me flip over to the correct putty. Um, change settings, appearance, let's make this thing readable. Now I'm gonna grab the right window. Okay, there we go. This is a Telnet session to it, okay? Logged into it. So that's the enable password, we needed that. Um, if I do a show who, it's gonna show me that SSH is probably disabled. Oh, it's enabled. I don't think I set this up on here. Now I'm gonna generate it. Let me see if I can SSH to this because it didn't actually work and that's a little disturbing to me. There we go. It worked. All right, I'm gonna try to do this quick because I wanna show you. Um, change settings. Let me grab the other window so you can see it. All right, perfect. This is an SSH session to it, okay? I have a username that I created. Logged in, SSH at. So that shows me that I'm connected via SSH, exactly what we wanted. Enable, now I need another password. Perfect. There you go, you can see my switch. All right, now what I wanna do is I wanna show you how to manage this guy using the web interface, okay? And the web interface is pretty slick. It looks like this. So you just navigate to the IP address of it, 9595, and you're, you're right in there, okay? And then all you do is you click on the login link and it's gonna ask me for my username and password. I'm not gonna save that, okay? And here we are, pretty fancy. Now, the coolest thing about this is you can turn power on to your ports if you need to. So the number one problem that we've seen with homeowners is the ICX is installed, power's turned on to the ports, the APs are plugged in, everything comes up, and then you take a power hit. And the power comes back on, everything comes back on except for your access points. <laughs> and that's because the the configuration that had to be made on the ACX to provide power to the access points was lost. And it's unfortunate, but this will help you recover that in the future. So you know how to save the configuration, you know how to put the, the inline power in there. Excuse me, so you go down here under port and utilization, you can go to inline power, okay? Now, this is the tricky part because you have an enable super user password on here. You have to click on this configure inline power, okay? but it will allow you to set the class that you want to do. Um, I'll probably set mine to unknown. You don't have to set the power limit. You don't have to set the priorities. You don't have to do any of this. You just want to sell it, tell it to enable it and then to enable it on the range of ports. And then you can select a single port if you want to, and then you just apply it. And then what you can do is this save button right here. We're going to save the configuration. This is basically the web UI's exact same way of typing write memory in the device, okay? Uh, there we go, and it fixed my power. Perfect, okay. So you can show that. The other cool thing you can look at is we, we like to see what our traffic statistics look like. Um, I do, I mean, I like to see what's going on. It's a little nerdy, but hey, that's, that's what I do, right? So you can find the stats, um, if I can find the link for it. I just have to stop putting so much pressure on me, I can't find everything quickly. <laughs> it's under interfaces, I thought. 
No, not management. Here we go. Go to port, go to ethernet. You can see all your ports here. So it'll tell you which ones are enabled or have something connected, the green ones are. Shows you enabled, um, shows you the speed, things like that. You can also go to the statistics. So it'll show you how many packets have been going through those ports. And you can also look at the utilization and this will give you percentages. So it'll show you what they're running at right now. Okay, and it'll also show you peak. So if you got hit with it really hard, then you know, you'll see your percentages here. And it's, it's just a good graphical look at it, it really is. Hey Lewis, I just responded to your comment. Thanks for coming in. Um, I'm here from the comment I made earlier. Okay, so Lewis, I'm gonna get to that real quick because Walter, I know you had questions about how to do um, some VLAN stuff in the ICX and then also push those into your Unleashed Access Point. I'm gonna cover that after I, I kind of help Lewis out real quick because his question's quick and yours is gonna take some demonstration stuff and uh, take a little bit of time. So Lewis, the, the thing I can tell you and the thing I'll show you is, I'm gonna show you a picture of this real quick, okay? There's your ICX, there's your access point. The main challenge you have is the access point that plugs into the ICX, the ICX is providing that access point power. The Cable modem can't do that. <laughs> it doesn't have a way to provide power to it, okay? Um, no matter if it has one port, two ports, or four ports on it, none of them provide power. It's just not what they're made for. So you can plug them in directly, they just won't be powered. You'll have to have an external power supply for that access point that you plug into the wall, then plug into the access point, and it'll function perfectly fine, okay? Uh, but yeah, you can do it, you just need the extra extra power supply and you would probably need um well depending on your setup i don't know what your house looks like exactly and how how much equipment you have in there but that's what you would need to do so okay hopefully that helps you um if you have a 7150 in there and it's not providing power let me know i'll show you how to turn it on it's easy all right walter you ready for this we're going to talk about some vlan stuff so let's say for example um, awesome. Happy to help, Lewis. All right, so let's talk Unleashed and VLANs for a minute. So let's say I have two VLANs that I want to configure, and the reason I want to do this, or I'll show you the exact way I do this at home, just to give you, it'll be a real world example, okay? I have three VLANs that I use. Um, I use 10, which is what my wife and I use to connect to our network. I use 20, which is what I use for the kids network. There's a special reason for that. I actually have four. I use 30, which is my home lab environment that I do some stuff in. Doesn't matter for Wi-Fi. I don't care about that. And then I also have 40 and 40 is my IOT VLAN. And I put everything that connects to the internet that's unmanaged, uncontrolled, wild, wild west stuff in VLAN 40. My television, my Echo B, my Alexa, if my stupid refrigerator decided it needed an IP address to report on ice cubes to somebody. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why my refrigerator needs an IP address, but anything at all that I know, my security system, everything, it connects on the IOT VLAN. And that's because in PFSense, I firewall it off. It can't go anywhere. It can't touch anything internally. It can get out to the internet. It can go phone home. That's it. That's all I care about. Okay. So how do I do that? Let's go back to putty, okay? And I'm gonna actually use the one that we're not, um, that isn't connected to my network right now to demonstrate this, okay? Uh, Walter, how many VLANs are you looking at configuring? Let's say four, let's say three. Very easy to do, okay? So what I'm gonna do first of all, is I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna create all my VLANs at once. Okay, so I'm gonna do config T, I'm gonna do VLAN 10 adults. Oops, hang on. VLAN 10, and then I'm gonna give it a name because I'm weird that way. Yep, four is perfect. And I'll, like I said, I'll show you exactly how I do this at home. It'll give you a real world example. And the beauty of this is this live stream is recorded, so it will be on the YouTube channel takes a little while to process. It'll be up tomorrow. I'll probably use this one as the video on demand, not the one from this morning. 
it'll be there. You can go back and reference it. And what I do after the fact is I'll go in and I'll add timestamps and that'll show you exactly where these things are happening. So we'll do VLAN breakouts at a certain time. I'll mark that so you can go right to that video. It'll show you how to do this. Okay. All right, so VLAN 10, that name is adults, okay? And then I'm gonna do VLAN 20, name kids, okay? VLAN 30, name uh, home lab. Oh, you bet, that's what I'm here for. Happy to do it. Uh, VLAN 40, name IoT. VLANs are built, piece of cake, okay? Now, this is where it gets fun. I might have to... Yeah, I don't know if I want to do that because I might wreak havoc, but pretend that some of these ports are up. <laughs> it's your imagination for me. Okay, we have to we have to tag and untag ports in certain ways. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just quickly explain this. Um, if I have a, a port that is untagged in one VLAN, that means that that device does not understand or speak VLANs at all. It doesn't know what they are. Perfect example, if I take my laptop and I took the ethernet port on it and I plugged it into that switch right now, it would be an untagged port, okay? If I took and needed to connect multiple devices with multiple VLANs to one port, think your access point, I would have to tag that traffic and I'm gonna tag that port in multiple VLANs, okay? It's the simplest explanation I can give you. Untagged basically means it's one host that doesn't understand VLANs. Tagging means there's multiple hosts or devices behind that one port that understands multiple VLANs, okay, for whatever reason. We're gonna leave everything in this environment untagged with the exception of one, how many access points do you have, Walter? One or three? I think you said earlier in chat and I might have missed it. I didn't miss it, I just flat forgot. Uh, you have two. Okay, perfect. So let's do this. Let's pretend that our cable modem is plugged into port 12. VLAN 1. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Okay. Oh, you have three. Perfect. Okay. So let's just say that all three access points are connected to the first three ports. One by one by one, one by one by two, and one by one by three. So those we're going to tag with everything. Okay. So... It's very simple, you can do this in ranges. So we're leaving our cable modem alone, that stays in VLAN one no matter what. Or, I mean, the, you wanna put your main network in the same VLAN kind of thing, so you might even wanna untag it in VLAN 10. My setup is different, mine is in bridge mode, which yours probably is too. So you can do whatever you want internally. You just have to have a, a specific VLAN or port for your cable modem running, right? We're worried about internal. So I'm gonna take one by one by one, one by one by two, and one by one by three, and I'm gonna tag all those ports in all four VLANs, okay? So you do config T, and you do V, we can do a range, VLAN 10, 20, 30, 40, okay? Multiple VLANs, 10 to 40, okay? And I'm gonna do tag E one by one by one, two, one by one by three. Let's say, for example, your access points are on port one by one by one, one by one by three, and one by one by five. Okay, so they're not in a sequential order. You just add them individually. That's it, you just add them. You would do tag ethernet E, one, 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 enter. One, one, three, enter. One, one, five, enter. That's all you do, it's easy. But you can do ranges too, so two. There we go, they're all in that VLAN now, okay? Easy, piece of cake. And as you can see, now we show that they're tagged in each of these VLANs, okay? The port for PFSense that's plugged into your ICX, you'd wanna do the same thing. You would wanna tag it in all of your VLANs because it's your DHCP server. So it's gonna wanna serve IP addresses to all four of your, um, assuming you're running in bridge mode, which if you are, it turns that functionality off, right? But PFSense becomes your DHCP server, so make sure it's tagged in every VLAN as well. That's the easy part. You don't even have to have IP addresses or VE interfaces on these VLANs because that's what PFSense is for. It's your gateway. So it does all your routing for you anyways. Okay. So now what you have to do is you have to jump over to the screen and we jump into our Unleashed network and we say, okay, well now I need to go create a Wi-Fi network, right? So I'm gonna create, I'm gonna name it IoT. I'm gonna put WPA2 on it. 
I'm going to create a password. Fridges do not get IPs. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so hell bent on refrigerators today, but anyways, go to advanced options, go to WLAN priority, uh, and then access VLAN. We set up our IOT VLAN as 40, select 40, click OK. There you go. Boom. Done. Okay. Now here's the other cool thing. You probably have done this at home. If you haven't, this is why I do this. I'm going to create a new one and I'm going to call it kids. Okay. WPA two bed time is at 10. Oh, you got through it, Andrew. Awesome. Okay. Um, stand by. Tell me how it went. Let me know you're back into it. You've got WLANs up. Now you don't see the ruckus SSID. Uh, the configure me or the recover me. That's good. You shouldn't. What did you set your WLAN name to? That's, that's the question. You should see that one. Okay. So bedtime is at 10. We have that. Now why I do this is you go into the WLAN priority and you tell it it's access VLAN is 20, right? But even better, you go to the service schedule and you say specific. And Walter, I'm sure you've done this. If you haven't, I don't know if you have kids at home. Um, or if you've discovered, you know, the perfect windows where somebody likes to Amazon shop and you turn the Wi-Fi off, <laughs> be a smart aleck. But I basically turn ours on, you know, every Monday from 6 a.m. to, uh, we'll say 1030. And you just set these bars in here. I will tell you this, you can do this via the mobile app. My hands struggle with doing this piece of it in the app. But you can set these times when you're... Wi-Fi is actually up. <laughs> yeah, you're tight. You're he's 21, so you're good. He or she. Um, but yeah, you can set these if you need to. And then Friday will go until midnight. Saturday midnight, and then Sunday is back to the real world. So we go here, set up. That's how you do it. I mean, that's really at the base level of it. Outside of the PFSense piece, that's it. I mean, get your PFSense firewall rules in there to allow traffic out, and then you're good to go. It's really what you need. Uh, does that help? Do you have more questions on it? Because I'm here. It's demonstration time. I'm happy to put this together. I don't have a curfew. I'll be here to help you with this no matter what. Um, oh, Brody. Okay, so. Yep. So here's what happened. Walter, you bet. Happy to happy to help out. Brody, here's what happened. <laughs> Switch code has an IP address configured in just for the system. Think of it that way. Router code doesn't do that. So it doesn't have a, um, it doesn't have a global IP address on it. So what you're going to have to do, Hey Lewis, thanks for subscribing. We'll see you when you come back. Always come back with your questions, man. That's what we're here, what we're here for. So thanks for stopping in and hanging out. So Brody, what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to get into it and put an IP address on it on one of the VLANs that you have, or you can boot it back into switch code just to get it back up. And then you can make a plan for how you want to configure your router code piece of it. But yeah, unfortunately that's kind of a common thing that happens when you switch to those, uh, it, you get bit with it. So yeah, router code, you're going to have to make a plan for that. Yeah, I've I've encouraged I've encountered the same thing. So you're it's not a rookie mistake. It bites all of us. It's frustrating and unfortunate, but you can resolve it. You can put an IP address on one of the the VLANs. That way you can get to it, and you know you just have to look at how your environment's built. That'll take care of it for you. Um, all right, Andrew, give me an update. Where's uh? And I don't see my WLAN name. Okay, so you gave it a WLAN. You can't see it anywhere? Are you trying on your laptop or are you trying on your phone? Yeah, and Brody, if it's blank, that's fine. I mean, uh, hopefully it's not too much of a headache for you. It'll, you can boot it back into switch code. You can leave it on router, get it configured. There's, there's multiple ways to do that. So whichever works for you, but yeah, that's what happened. I don't know how news anchors get on TV and talk about all the world events for hours on end. 
without taking a drink of water. Those guys are crazy. Animals, I tell you. Andrew, we're going to fix this. Um, anybody experience intermittent performance issues with the Air Surfboard running lag to PF Cinch, which is connected over lag to the 7450? All right, Jason, let's uh, let me take a step back. You have a lag configured between your PF Sense device and your 7450, or do you have a lag configured between PF Sense and the Era Surfboard, or do you have one to both? SS Productions. How can I manage my ICX7150 C12 PM and Mac? I mean, how and where can I open that configuration screen? Do I need a wire to connect? You do. So, SS, what you need to do is you'll, you'll need a cable. Um, and you're going to need a cable that's... How new is your Mac? Is it a MacBook Pro? So I'm assuming it's all USB-C. Anyways, you need a USB to USB-C cable or a USB-C to USB-C cable or USB-A to A cable. It doesn't matter. So the 7150 has two console ports or three console ports. It has this one which is what I'm using, but you need you need an adapter to do it. It's a serial to USB adapter. You can get them off Amazon. It's really unnecessary. You can plug in a USB cable here, or you can plug in the USB-C cable here. That will get you into the console of it. Uh, oh, a MacBook Air. Okay, so it has USB. You just need a USB to USB-C cable. If you have any anything like that laying around, go grab it. I'll help you get into it. You can actually download a version of Putty for Mac, it exists. You have to dig a little bit. Um, you might have to do some homebrew magic with it, but you can get a version of um, Putty running on your Mac. Excuse me. Then you can get into the console of it, and you'll be good to go. Okay. And if you want to do it now, if you have a USB cable laying around and you want some assistance with it, I'm happy to help you out. That's why I'm here. So. Um. <laughs> well, Jason, we're here every Wednesday, and uh, unfortunately, this is. Probably the last one we're doing it in the evening, but if there's a large demand for it, we'll keep doing it. I don't have any issues with that. Um, so yeah, serial for Mac might work as well. There's some out there. It'll get you into the console of it, but um, if you want to go grab a cable, we'll help you get into it. We'll get you set. I know Andrew struggled with this last week, uh, but he was able to get into it with a Mac. Everything's working in terms of the ICX. I'm just trying to help him get his... Uh, Wi-Fi network to show up now and it's not for some silly reason. So uh, let's see. So I can speak to are the lags up, the lag interfaces are up and everything's working fine. If you do a show lag in the ICX, you don't see anything hokey going on with that. Um because I mean if the lags are up, I don't I don't know how. So <laughs> all right, let me get a little technical on this one for you for a second. I, I understand how lags work between ICX devices. I know how lags work between competitor devices because they work the same way. So they basically balance traffic between the two links so that you don't have one running at 60% and the other one sitting there twiddling its thumbs. It does it based off of source and destination IP address or source and de destination MAC address, but it hashes them so it splits them out evenly. I don't know how the surfboard does it, to be honest with you. I'm not sure. Um, I, I hate doing this. I, it bothers me. I feel like I'm copping out when I do this. I want to see if Nightbot woke up yet. But honestly, I'm going to recommend that you go out and try the forums. There might be some information out there about that. I don't have as much exposure to the Era surfboards from that regard as you do. Um, I just, I don't have it. So I don't know how they hash. I don't know how the algorithms work. Um, I, I'm not really sure what's going on with that. So that's, that's the crummy part of it. Um, yeah, that might be it. Uh, I don't know. Try the forums. Somebody somewhere in those forums has some information about it. And if they don't, we'll, we can pull some of the heiress people in to take a look at it and see what's going on. There's probably some statistics in there. Can you get into your cable and into the surfboard? Can you get into it and look at stats or errors? I mean, are you getting errors? 
Is it dropping frames or packets anywhere? Um, okay, let me go back up through chat here a little bit. <laughs> Andrew, you're funny. I can help with that. That was last week. You still don't see your WLAN. Um, well, where to go? So you got, it's really sensitive. I, I, I don't mean to belabor this point. That reset button is super sensitive. So when you hold it on there, can you see the power light and you see it go red and you count to, what did, what did Anusha tell me to count to? 12, 15, something like that. Hold that button in as hard as you can and just make sure it stays depressed for 12 seconds and then let go of it. And that should put it, and you just went through the reset, but it's still not showing the WLAN. That's really odd. I don't, that doesn't sound right to me. I'm kind of starting to wonder if you have an access point that's faulty. Hmm. And you have a Windows machine. Interesting. Uh, Jason, you want me to show you how to check which part, how to check uh, errors in the lag? I can show you in an ICX. I mean, I don't have one configured right now, but I can show you how to check the stats of it. In the um, in the surfboard, I, this thing only has one port, so it wouldn't it wouldn't support lag any uh, lag anyways. Um, but you can do this. Might show, yeah, lag blue. So I just created one for the fun of it. And if I do a show lag, it's going to give me all this information. It's not going to show you um, interface errors per se. It'll show you whether it's up or down, what's going on with the state of it. Um, but port stats you're not going to get. You can show those. Do you know what version of software you're running? Are you running 8090 or higher, 8070 or higher? Because otherwise you can do a show interface E one by one by five. That'll at least show you the port, but what I would do is just do a show stat E one by one by five. That shows statistics. And it'll show you if you have any errors on there. Oh, 8090, yeah. You, and you can even do a show interface lag. What might I call it 10? And that'll show you the ports that are in it. But do a show statistics. Um, I wonder if you can do that. Yeah, lag 10. You can do a show stat on the lag interface. And this is the part you're really looking for. Um, output errors, collisions, late collisions, CRC, input errors. See if you have anything in there. Um, that'll that'll get you some information of it. Okay. All right, let me run back through chat here. Um, Daniel, yes, what do you recommend as far as getting the best performance throughput out of an R510? So a couple things. And we talked about this. Um, somewhat extensively last week, and I'm more than happy to talk about it now. I would recommend going back and watching last week's stream. Um, if you have more than one access point in your house, I would strongly recommend that you change your BSS min rate for your w WLAN. And what that does is it tells clients, your phone, decide when they roam. The access points don't decide that. And the clients decide that based off of what their connection strength is to it. And if you let it run at whatever it wants, it basically lazy. It's like a teenage kid. You ask them to go take the trash out and they lay there and stare at it for 10 minutes. Like you've got horns growing out of your eyeballs. <laughs> Just, I mean, it's a terrible analogy and I know that, but you, you can tweak that. So what we tell people, if you're seeing, performance not really being the best that you want it to be try the bss min rate in fact here's a great example my daughter last night was trying to watch netflix um before she went to bed and it was not behaving and so i had to go in and follow my own advice because i have three access points in the house and i had to set the bss min rate and i set it to 12 and it changes it for both 2.4 and 5 gig radios. Every single client I had connected to Wi-Fi in the house moved to a different AP as soon as I did that. So what that's doing 
is it's basically telling um, uh, Andrew the air light means that there's a mesh connection. So it means that you have more than one access point or um, it just means there's a mesh, mesh connection based on the guide. You said you only have one AP though. Um, what the BSS min rate does is, is it's not necessarily handling the, the speed of traffic at what you're uploading, downloading on your device. It deals with your management and control traffic. So if my phone can't transmit the management and control traffic between it and the access point at a rate of 11 megabits per second, that access point's basically gonna say, no way, dude, go somewhere else. And what the phone will do is say, oh, I lost connection to this access point within my mesh. It's gonna jump to the nearest one because it needs that strong connection because the access points are saying you have to be strongly connected. It's the, it's the number one way that support handles roaming issues right now. We don't use the roam profiles to resolve that. Uh, you do it through the BSS min rate. And since we're here and we're talking about it, I'll show you. So I'm going to go back in. I've got to get a new session going. So give me just a second to get this going. Uh, new session. Let's just show you how to do this. It's super easy. Let's see, change settings. I wish this would stay. I tried to set this up to do it by default all the time, but apparently it doesn't want to listen. Let me change the, the source on this guy real quick. Firefox. Is it that guy? Okay. So the crummy part of it, guys, is you have to SSH into your access point. Um, and to SSH to it, it's pretty simple. If we go here to our Unleashed dashboard, if you don't know the IP address of it, you go to unleash.ruckuswireless.com and Andrew, I promise we're gonna get you to that point. Um, and Andrew, I wouldn't reset the, the switch. I don't think you need to. Maybe pull the power on, maybe pull the cable out of that access point. Are you 100% sure you only have one access point? That's my question, because I think you might be resetting one that's a member of the mesh, it's not the mesh master. And if it's a Lennar home, and if it's multiple stories, you probably have another one hiding somewhere. Um, if you need the IP address of it, you go to unleash.ruckuswireless.com and then you can go down to um, access points. And then you just click on your access point here. Oh, no, wait, I'm on the wrong speed. I'm on the wrong spot. Admin and services, and then you go to IP settings. And right here, it's going to tell you the IP address of that guy. So you can um, you can just SSH directly to that IP address. The other thing you can probably do, you can probably SSH to unleash.ruckuswireless.com as well. That's an HTTP redirect, so I don't know how it would work trying to SSH to that, but you, you can do it. It'll work. Okay. All right. Um... Let's do this. So I'm on the wrong window. All right. So once you log into it, it's using the same credentials that you use to log into Unleashed. And it uses the same thing as the, as the ICX. Once you get logged in, you just do enable. Okay. And one thing I will recommend is if you have old legacy devices in your house, if you have anything that's running at 802.11b, don't do this. If you no longer have anything that is 802.11b, you can do this. Now, I will caution you on this. And Walter, a good thing for you with this is if you have an IoT VLAN and you have a ring doorbell or a Vivint front point, who, there's thousands of them. If you have a video doorbell, they only run at 2.4 gigahertz. They're old radios, and I don't know if they run at B or not. So I wouldn't do this on your IoT VLAN. Um, but I would do it on the VLAN you use, your phones on, your tablets on, your laptops, that I think you're probably safe. But if anything's B, don't do this. So what we're gonna do is, first um, I need to make sure I know what my WLAN names are and they're matched based on what the CLI sees, okay? So I'm gonna do AP mode, and I'm gonna do get WLAN list, all one word, okay? And it's gonna show me my WLAN interfaces, but the one I'm really worried about is this one, Ruckus at Home. It's case sensitive. So if you know Linux, you know that case sensitive matters. 
So we have to do this precisely. If I do this command and I do ruckus at home like that, when I specify the WLAN name, it's not gonna change this one. It's gonna create a brand new WLAN named ruckus at home, all lowercase. So keep that in mind, okay? We'll quit out of that and I'm gonna do configure, okay? Oh my goodness, okay? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do WLAN name, and you can use question marks, I'm gonna do ruckus at home. Oh, I was wrong, sorry. Okay, WLAN ruckus at home. I'm in that WLAN to configure it, okay? And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do OFDM only. This turns off the 802.11b functionality and the access point. One of the main reasons why I wanna do this is because now I can't move my BSS min rate to something above 11 if I don't do that because 802.11b, that's at ceiling, so it needs to be able to do that. I wanna set it to 12. And I can set this to 12 and I can set it higher over time if I need to, if I see good behavior and performance out of it, this is something you can tweak. You can start at six, you can then go to 12, you can then go to 24, stop at 24, don't go higher. What you'll probably see when you set this to 12, typically you'll see transmission rates higher than that anyways, but it's the weaker signals that you're gonna correct. So then what you do is you just do BSS min rate and I set it to 12, okay? The management transmit rate will be set to the same value as BSS min rate, that's fine. So now you, you have to type end to make this stick. Okay, changes have been saved. Quit, show WLAN name, ruckus at home. When you do that, uh, it's in here somewhere. OFDM only state is enabled. So no 802.11b. BSS min rate, 12 megabits per second, right there, it's set. Okay, that's how you do it, that's all that's required. And like I said, I did this last night. Every single device I had in my house roamed at that point. They all split and went to different APs. And I errantly thought before, um, the default min rate is usually 5.5, especially because OFDM only isn't on. So OFDM mode is running or not running. So it's usually set to 5.5 by default, uh, which means you can have a device that's far enough away with a weak enough signal that it'll stay on that access point. And, you know, I mean, clients, once they attach to an access point, they just kind of stay there. They don't really let go of it. This will then force it to say, oh man, I got to find a new home. And they will. So when you do this, you'll see immediate changes right away. Okay. These are steps that are used by our support staff. This is exactly how they handle roaming. They'll get into roam profiles and the roam factors if need be. So the thing you have to understand with, especially Ruckus hardware, competitors hardware is the same way. The roam, roam factor is something that it's, we use a term called stickiness. How sticky is that roam factor? And when you look at the stickiness of it, there's a level from one to 10. I'm gonna get this wrong because the roam factors in here and I have it set in the middle somewhere. I think this one's been changed. Uh, I think 10 is the stickiest. Don't quote me on that, please. Oh, roam factor is one. Okay, but smart roam is disabled anyways. Don't worry about that. So the roam factor is one. That means that's the stickiest roam factor you can get. Once the client attaches to that guy, that client and that access point are basically gonna stay married as long as they can, even if there's a better one out there. So setting the BSS min rate really kind of changes that behavior and says, I'm not really worried about the other factors that go into roaming. I'm worried about what your actual connection speed to me is. And if it starts to, to dwindle, you're gonna go somewhere else. And you can, you can look through logs in here and it'll show you um, if you have clients disconnecting from the access point, it'll give you reason codes. And if you see that, you can translate those, um, 
I guess we'll call them reason codes, but that's what they are. They're well documented. It's an industry standard thing. And you can go in and it'll just turn around and you can figure it out. So if it's if the client left, it means it got too far away and it's having troubles with that. Smart Roam, you can turn it on via the, the UI. So if I go into Wi-Fi networks and I go to Ruckus at Home and I edit it, um, you can look at this, I think it's here. So it's this fast BSS transition. Um, and it's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not an expert in this. I don't turn it on. Supports always told me do not turn it on. Um, they have said very supportingly use the BSS min rate. It's basically the way your mesh network works is you have three access points all connected to your ICX and there's all this control traffic going on between them. They're trying to intelligently make decisions on how to force clients to roam to another access point if need be. Um, I will make you a deal since you guys asked. I'm, I'm not well versed enough in exactly what this technology entails. And I never have been because I've always just recommended that you don't turn it on. And that's a recommendation I got from support. And our support people are awesome, so I don't even argue with them. Um, I will look into this. I will, I will dig into this. I'll find out. I'd be more than happy to come back and talk about this for sure. And if you are interested and you want the answers, send an email to ruckuslive at comscope.com. I will create a forum post and I will put it out there and put all the information in there for you. I could dig, I'll just have to dig through our knowledge base and find the, the actual reasoning for that. Okay. I don't want to misspeak. I don't want to mislead you guys. I don't know the answer, but I will go find out. Okay. Okay. Let me do this. I'm going to run back through chat real fast because I want to see what I missed. Uh, Daniel, does that help give some additional details and info for you? Makes sense. Ooh. Jason, you bring up a really good, good point. Oh, I didn't even show you guys. You asked me about this. <laughs> Where to find the, the smart room, and it's in the CLI. Sorry, I, I just forgot to hit the switch button on the, on the Stream Deck. So you go to Wi-Fi Networks, you select your network, and you go to Edit. Under Advanced Options, you go to Radio Control, and this is that fast BSS transition. This is the smart room functionality. There's different technology that goes into it. And like I said, I'll, I'll find the answers for that for you guys, okay? Um, okay. DHCP issue. I think that might be what's going on. So, Andrew, do you have a cable that's running between your cable modem and your ICX? Because that's what I'm worried about right now. <laughs> Jason, you sound like you do the same thing I do. I'm like, hmm, what does this do? Smart Roam. <laughs> I'm going to remember that one. I've done that. I mean, I turn things on sometimes, and then I go in and read about it, and I'm like, that was not smart. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> All right, hopefully Andrew's still here, because... I think it's his DHCP issue, Jason. I think you're exactly right. That's what's going on with it. Oh, read up. You're good. You got it set. You're on your Wi-Fi network and everything. Come on, man. Don't play with my emotions. I can't handle it. You're good. That's awesome. You're good. You promise. You don't have any issues. Everything's set. You're connected to your Wi-Fi. The WLAN you created, you're happy. Yeah, you got to give us details, man. I mean, come on, don't leave us, don't leave us hanging. This is like group high five time. <laughs> I'm gonna assume that's the case, anyways. Yeah, that makes me super happy. Uh, read up. I guess I'm trying to look up. I don't. The last thing I see from you it says, "What is air on the AP?" Did I admit, did it chat not pick something up? 
Let me look here. Maybe I'll reset again. What is air on the AP? No. I don't. It, it, maybe it didn't show up in here. Oh, or maybe, did you tag me specifically in the chat message? Because if you did, I don't know if it would show up in here. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't see it. Weird. That's goofy. So Nightbot isn't working. Um, your chat message didn't show up. Maybe it, there's ghosts or something. Who knows? Let's go with that. I don't believe in ghosts, but I don't knock people that do. Let's see. Yeah, I don't see it, man. I'm sorry. It's not there. It's not. For whatever reason. Just like how Nightbot has decided to take the night off. That really perturbs me, too, because there's timers that kick in there. And none of it's working. <laughs> like, at all. They're all enabled. Nightbot's there as a moderator on the channel. It's in the channel. Nothing's happening. Let me try one more command. Maybe what I'll do is, if you guys don't mind, maybe I'll have you do this as well. If somebody wouldn't mind, try that exclamation point command and see if Nightbot will wake up for you because there's a lot of good info that, that hits there. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I don't know. Weird. Um, no idea. I wish I could understand it. Oh, he did a hard reset on it. And that, that's all it was. And then it got you back into it. Awesome. Use my app on my phone to run through setup again. Jonathan, I, yes, there's BSS min rates. So BSS min rates across the board. Um, oh, and it worked. Okay. High fives to everybody. Andrew's set. He's working. That is great news, and actually that makes me extremely happy because it shows that this is helpful, and that's all I care about. So I gotta be honest, man, I'm super happy about that. So big thumbs up, congratulations, you're online. Hopefully everything's running great for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, for being patient and sticking with it, and I'm extremely happy about that. Uh, Jonathan, the answer is, yeah, <laughs> the three time. Uh, I'm not trying to one-up you because I can't, but I've had to do the same thing. <laughs> So, yep, it's uh, it's one of those things. So, ah, uh, I got gotcha. you. Okay, and you only have one access point, correct? Um, Jonathan, yes. So BSS min rate is something that will be available. Oh, you only have one AP. Yep. So you're good. If you did the mesh, it kind of wreaks havoc on it. Um, but yeah, you're good. That's awesome. Great. Glad to hear it. Uh, Jonathan, yes. BSS min rate is across the board. So Unleash software when you look at it, it's actually based on zone director. So a lot of the commands that you're using, um, <laughs> air high fives for sure. A lot of the commands that you're seeing us use on this CLI, there's similar commands for that within the zone director APs or the zone director managed APs. Um, there's also similar commands for that, for the smart zone APs, but the smart zone controller and the, the zone director controller have much more robust management capabilities. Um, yeah, Andrew, probably. So within smart zone and zone director, you can, you can set all that stuff in there and we'll, we'll look at that stuff next week because I'll have smart zone running. I'll actually have zone director and smart zone running and we can run through that and see where that is, but it'd be a gooey thing. And just in the, in the UI, we'll check it there. Um, oh yeah. Your POE doorbell isn't working. Are you in the ICX? We can fix that. And then I'm going to stack these ICXs. Um, Okay, two questions. Do you know what port on the ICX? I'm going to show you guys a command, and if you have ICXs, you're going to love this if you don't know about it. Um, awesome. Yeah, it'll be 11 a.m. Mountain Time, Jonathan, next week. But if you guys have desire to have this stuff done twice, one during the day, one at night, because obviously some employers don't allow you to sit around and watch live streams for a couple of hours during the day, um, I can run one in the evening as well. I'm more than happy to do that. Um, Andrew, two questions. Do you know what port on your ICX the ring doorbell is plugged into? And 
do you have access to the ICX via the command line? Those are the only two things you need. I'm gonna show you how to do this. It's a really awesome command. You guys are gonna love this, I promise. I'm actually really proud of this one. We have a really cool cable tool or a cable test utility in the ICX itself. So it's really hard to complain about that. Um, I just have to go find the command. Oh wait, it's in here. Yes. I got it. I have my cheat sheet. You guys can't see the cheat sheet, but I have a cheat sheet. <laughs> uh, which one is this? Back to the command prompt one, or the this one here. Okay. I don't know if you know what port. You don't necessarily need to know what port. Um, we can run this. You can run it on all of them. There's certain things that we're looking for. Um, but knowing which port it's plugged into would be helpful. So hopefully it's the only things you have plugged into it would be your cable modem, which you can trace that cable easy. Your access point, that has power to it. We can find that one easy. And then the one that doesn't have power or probably doesn't even have link is the one where the doorbell's plugged into it. So we'll find that one as well. It can power that doorbell. That doorbell's power draw is tiny, so there's not much to it. But let's do this. So you want to check and see if you have a bad cable. Okay. So in Andrew's case, what I, I'm not assuming this is going on, but there's a potential that this is what's going on. Um, you might have a bad cable. And if you do, <laughs> the, the thing that sucks about that is you might have to get an electrician in there or somebody that has crimpers. Um, but this is what you do. So we're going to do a, a cable test on it. So you're going to do this clear cable diagnostics. What's up? TDR one by one by 12. Okay. That clears it. Now you do a PHY cable diagnostics TDR one by one by 12. Okay. This is doing a physical cable test on it. It ran it. It's done. Now let's show it. Show cable diagnostics TDR one by one by 12. Okay. Boom. Everything is terminated. Tells you the pair length and it tells you the speed. If this come back, comes back and tells you that it's running at 100 megabit. It's most likely, uh, where's pair C this pair right here. The local pair is probably not crimped correctly because pair C is where you're going to lose your power if it's broken. So we can run these commands and see, um, I don't, yeah, I mean, as long as the cable's plugged in. So Andrew, I guess this is my question. How many, how many physical ports or physical cables do you have plugged into your ICX right now? Because we know of three, right? We know of your cable modem, your access point, and your ring doorbell. And do all three of them have a link light? And then what I mean by link light is, do you see those green blinky lights on the port? Right there. <laughs> like Andrew saying, Bueller. Okay, you know which port has it. Is, does it have a link light or no? Oh, yep. Is that... So it's not just a... Jason, it's not just a straight raw cable that goes from the doorbell down to the comm box where the ICX is, there's an actual patch panel in there. Because if that's the case, if they went A on one side and B on the other, that's a problem. You want to be on B on both sides. Yep. Okay. If that's the case, Andrew, you might have a patch that's done incorrectly. You can run these commands uh, on the putty that I just did. 
you can run these three commands right here on the port with the ring doorbell. Um, and you should be able to correct that. I, I've had patches done incorrectly too, and I can pull them off and redo them. Um, you just need a little tool that does it. And I don't know if they left you a key. It's just, it's called a key and it's how you push the cables into the termination point. But if you take those keystone jacks out and you flip them around and look at them, it'll show you the, the A pattern and the B pattern on them. Um, oh yeah, I, the recommendation is to use B. If you go A to A, it'll work fine. Uh, but for whatever reason, the, the recommendation is B. But if it's working, that old saying, if it's broken, don't fix it. Or if it's not broken, don't fix it. It's late, sorry. Um, I wonder if that's what's going on. Yeah, and you have the tools, so you, you deal with that stuff a lot too. Yeah, you can run these commands, um, Andrew. Hopefully that will show you that you have speed broken or pairs that aren't terminated. Um, yeah, stream is it's about a 10 second delay. That's just so I can beep out all my swear words. I'm kidding. Yep, everything has a link light but the ring doorbell. See see if you can get into the command line of your ICX and do these three commands on the port that the ring doorbell is plugged into. And if you haven't, if it's terminated incorrectly on either end, it will tell you. So it will say not terminated or something similar to that. Um, yeah. And Jason, I'm assuming you're probably in a Lennar home maybe, um, or a home that has, a, with a builder that does a lot of this stuff. Um, but yeah, if you can get into that and do it, this absolutely, I would do that. That's what you're going to need to do. And then you're going to have to, I don't know. Um, I guess I'm not familiar with the processes in terms of what the home builders use. I'm assuming you can contact them. If your neighborhood's still being built out, you could probably swing into the sales office and say, Hey, I've got a, a doorbell termination. That's incorrect. I need somebody to come out and resolve it. They should take care of that. Um, if not, go find your local neighborhood nerd <laughs> and have them come over and help you with it. Um, oh, you did it all custom. Yeah. See, I, the house I live in right now, I don't, I don't have the ability to run cable everywhere because the builder that built our home and our house is it's not super old, but it's older. And the way they did it was the most harebrained thing I'd ever seen. And so for somebody like myself to go in and see how limited I was, uh, I was not happy. So it was frustrating. It was really, really frustrating. Uh, if you have this, the cable that you bought, Andrew, and you just plug into the console the same way you did the other day, plug into the console the same way and get into it that way. Because I don't know if we ever turned on Telnet or SSH for you. So use that Siri or the uh, USB cable, get in the console, plug into it with the same that serial program that you used. You'll get into it there um, and it'll give you a prompt like this. Oops. When you first get into it, make sure you type enable. Oops. Oh no, what did I set this password to? Ruckus? Yeah. <laughs> yep, either of those work. And I think he has a USB cable because he had to go get one to get into it. Never a dull moment around here, man, I tell you. Always lots of fun. Yep. Yeah, I would use the USB cable, but I just didn't bring it with me. It's sitting at home. So that's one of the nice things about this model of ICX is it does have USB console capabilities, which is very helpful. Very, very helpful. All right, while he's doing that, I'll, I'll kind of jump back and forth. Um, yeah, you bet. So just plug the... Oh, you need the commands or you just need... Oh, sure, I'll help you. Here, let me, let me do this, watch. You're in. All right, so you're going to get a, a console that looks exactly like... Let me reset my terminal here. You probably have something like that, right? And if you see the little carrot right here, just type enable. You won't get a password prompt. But you should now get a prompt with the with the hashes like this, or the pound sign. I'm carbon dating myself again. Okay, once you get to that point... Then you type this, clear cable diagnostics. Oh, that's fine. Okay, good. You're at the prompt you need to be. Perfect. So now type this exactly as I'm doing it. Clear cable diagnostics, TDR, and then 
I don't know what port your doorbell's on, so I'm gonna just pretend that it's on port. You replace five with whatever port it's on, okay? And you do that. In fact, I can just do this. Where did it go? What port's your ring doorbell on? I don't know. Four. So you run that command. Next you run... Oh my goodness, get with it. Next you run this command. You can copy and paste these in. And then you run this command. Just change the port number on there with whatever port you're on. So one by one by whatever port. Or don't use four and don't use one by one by 12. Change that to what you have. And that'll fix you right up. And then just tell me what it says if it says um, under pair status, if it's showing you terminated, if there's any problems with it. I'm guessing based on what Jason's saying, it's probably not terminated. You're probably having issues in that, in that regard with it. Okay. All right, stacking time. So what we're gonna do, oh, it's on six. So just replace four and 12 with six, or five. Yeah, that's fine. So all you need to do is do one by, uh, one by one by five. Oops. This is the last part of your command right there. All right, so in the forums the other day, we had a, um, a Lenar homeowner actually come in and say, whew, our ICX is full. <laughs> so she has two options, really. She can move to the 7150-24 port, or if she came across an additional ICX, she could stack it. Um, my recommendation would be probably just to go to the 24 port. But if you're in a position and you have two and you want to stack them, you can. So 7150-C12Ps stack with each other. We don't support mixed stacking. So you can't stack a 7250 with a 7450. You can't stack a 7150 with a 7750, etc. cetera. Okay. I'm not even sure you can stack a C12P with a 24P. I don't, I don't think, I don't know. I've never tried it. Um, but since we have these two devices, we can stack them together and they're connected. I'm saying invalid input. Oh yeah, they're noisy. Very, 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 very noisy. And it, and it has more fans in it too. Do you have dual power supplies in there, Jason? Um, anyways, it's connected via these. These are the stacking ports, okay? Those ports are running at 10 gig. So we're basically gonna have a 20 gig stack happening here. Okay. Um, oops. Wrong one. Yeah, dual power supplies, that's gonna kill you. Every time. I don't know of any options for you. <laughs> yeah, they're noisy as heck, I agree. I mean, they're awesome, they do great things, but yeah, uh, the 7150 won't support BGP either, I don't think. Tons of power. Man, you can power all kinds of things. You can power PoE TVs with that thing if you wanted to. Um, cause I think it has HPOE ports in it. All right. So we're going to stack this guy. So if I do a show stack, it's showing me that it's not enabled right now. Right. Morning stack is not enabled. So we do config T and we just type stack enable. That's it. We have a little bit more to do. <laughs> Special weather seals on doors. You know, it's funny the things you come up with at home to kind of hack and slash around problems like that. I get it. But hey, you have an awesome lab environment and a network environment, you know what I mean? All right, so once that's done, this command has changed. So now in 8090, we need to run a stack interactive setup. But there's something I wanna show you that I like to do before this. So I'm the type of person when I look at this thing, Andrew, don't worry, I'm not, I'm not leaving until you're set, okay? I wanna know physically Andrew, type this command in and tell me if it says, type that. Tell me what it says for one by one by five. So if you do this, 
on one by one by five, it does it tell you that it's down? Whoa. And also do this, show inline power. Oops. Also do that and send me, <laughs> you want me to trade you? I bet I know a guy that can get me a deal on one. <laughs> uh, no, I don't, because they're noisy. <laughs> Um, show inline power one by one by five. Also send me the output of that. We'll take a look at that. Okay. When it comes to stacking, I like, I physically like to look at the rack and I want to know what switch is on top, what one's on bottom, what, where they are. Okay. I also want to somewhat have a level of control over how they stack and what it looks like when they're stacked. So I keep doing that. Um, so what I like to do is I like to get the actual Mac address of this guy. So the stack Mac is showing me that it's this. Now, I don't know if you knew this or not, but in ICX, if you look at your show interface, I think I can do a brief. Yep. And you want to know what the system Mac address is of that device. It's the Mac address of the very first port on the box. So one by one by one, that's your system Mac as well. So I like to know that because when you run through stack interactive, it says down. Okay. What does the inline power command say? Um, I like to know that because the interactive command is going to ask me like, is this topology? Okay. okay. So when you do the show, uh, stack interactive setup, oops, I think it's hyphenated. Okay. We get some options. Yes. Let's talk. Absolutely says it's down. Oh, that's the show interface brief. What about the show inline power, Andrew? Okay, so we can do, okay, perfect. Yeah, do that show inline power 115 and send me that output too. That'll be specific to just that port. All right, so you can do certain things. You can quit, you can change your stack unit IDs, you can discover and convert new unit IDs, you can discover and convert existing new standalone units to members. That's what we want. So the, the switch that we have underneath it has no configuration on it. Now the caveat with this is if you're gonna stack them, you have to have the exact same matching version of software on the devices that are being stacked. Okay. It's a requirement. So we're gonna select three. Okay, now it's gonna probe the topology. So what it's doing is it's sending out discovery packets over these two links right now, because they're just connected to each other. And it's saying, hey, who's out there? Who do I know? What's going on? So when it comes back, it comes back with this and it shows us, oh, I found a unit. Okay, I found a friend. So it discovered one chain or ring. And the reason it's a ring is because of the two cables that are connected to it. Okay. So do I want to accept this chain? Yes. Now, I know that this is the MAC address of the other device because when we just looked at our MAC address, it was 2F64. This one's 0482. So I'm okay with that. So the default it's telling me is going to be two. That's what I want. I want the second unit to be two. Okay. So I say, okay, do I want a ring? Yes. And I'll show you why that's important. This is the topology. And the topology is telling me that, um, the, let me see here. This is your unit ID right here. Okay. So stack unit ID one, for example, stack unit ID one, two. Okay. Super simple. These are the ports that they connect on. So this is saying that remember how your port works one by one by one, one by whatever, one by three by one. That's because that port is considered in module three, unit one, module three, port one is connected to Unit two, module three, port two. So two by three by two. And then here, one by three by two is connected to two by three by one. So it shows you the physically topology of it, okay? ASCII art, that thing, the first time I looked at it confused the living daylights out of me. Now it's fine, so, okay. Hey, making tech sense, welcome. Yeah, we just ran through it. I'm more than happy to recover it and go back to it. So. What's happening now is the second ICX in the stack is rebooting. I'll show you. There. OK, 
Okay, I just plugged my console into it. Oh, you stacked at work, awesome. Um, welcome, by the way, thanks for uh, stopping by, appreciate it. So this is just rebooting. What happened is unit ID one, talked to the second unit in the stack and it said, hey, we have the same unit ID, that's not good. So your unit ID is now gonna be number two. And he said, oh, okay, I'll be number two, but to do that, I have to reboot. So it's rebooting it, when it comes back up, it'll be fully stacked. Okay. There we go. All right, Andrew. Um, oh no. Yep, man, Andrew, I hate, I, one of these days, yep, I saw that. So that means that power's turned onto the port, but whatever's plugged into that port, isn't drawing power from it. So most likely one of two things is going on. They didn't terminate the cable going to the doorbell or the keystone jacks are cabled incorrectly. So I hate to tell you this because I keep trying to solve your problems during the stream, but unfortunately I think you're gonna have to go back to Lennar and say, I've got a cable that's not correctly terminated for my doorbell and I need you guys to terminate. Because the problem is that doorbell won't come on until it has power. Like it, it's not wired like typical doorbells are. So you're gonna have to go ask them to get somebody out to come out and look at it. And they should do that. I mean, it was supposed to be done that way when you purchased the house. So I would just go in and make sure that they take care of you. I would love to be able to fix it, but unfortunately I think you're in a position where power, you can tell them, Ruckus help me, power's on to the port that's plugged into it. It's either the cable is terminated incorrectly or it's not terminated at all. And they need to come and put um, cat five ends on those cables and plug them in and get the port back up. So, cause all those cables that are hanging there, they probably run to different rooms in the house. And one of them, they might've just terminated the wrong one. It's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, you can get a tester. So you can actually plug the tester into one end and then you can go down to the other and it's got a little sniffer thing on it. And what it does is it sends a tone down that cable and you run it along the cable and it'll beep if it's connected to the right one. So you can get a tester, it'll tell you. And since, yeah, I, sorry man, I wish I could fix it for you, but that's that's what's going on with it. So. All right, this thing's coming back up and it's coming up stacked. So if we do a show stack, look at that. Stack. So we now have, if you look at this, both of these devices are now not terminated means it's probably it either. It's one of those cables that's hanging in your closet without an end on it, or the end that's the end that's on there isn't on there correctly. Okay. But yeah, what Jason is saying, it'll help you find the right, the right breaker basically. So grab that tester you can pull the doorbell off and plug into the the jack on the on the wall and uh go from there um but yeah anyways with the stacking so now we even have led lights to display it so it's telling you what unit numbers are on there i know this camera isn't the best but it's outlining that um so what this really does is it gives us two devices that are managed under one management interface okay and when you look at this show interface brief now we're going to have double the ports that we had before so before we had 12 ports well now we have 24 that we can use so andrew absolutely man that's what i'm here for i'm happy you at least got the ap's up and the icx is there and you have one more problem to solve but like i said you can either go get a tester or you can I like I said if if the neighborhood isn't fully built out yet just run into the sales office and ask them they'll have somebody they'll they have electricians that they can send out you know that'll take care of it or depending on your circle of friends maybe you can find somebody that understands low volt um, knows how to terminate this stuff anything I mean what you can do is you can get somebody that can go down there and terminate everything and then just plug everything in and your doorbell will come up <laughs> so you have options there too but I'm glad we got at least two thirds of everything working. So that makes me feel better. I'll sleep good tonight for that. Um, yeah, but yeah, making tech sense, right. The more ports, the better. And it uh, sounds like you've been stacking a lot of stuff at work. So yeah, that's it. It's really simple. Stacking became really, really easy in 8090 when they introduced the stack interactive setup command. 
And the really cool thing about this is there's now two types of configurations on this device. So let's say, for example, I have it stacked and I say, eh, whoops, I need to tear the stack apart because I need to reallocate this switch out of this closet, move it to the other side. It's not gonna be stacked. I need them to be separate, whatever reason, multitude of reasons, right? Super easy, stack, unconfigure, me. But, uh, module two is these ports right here. And the use case for them, they're gig ethernet ports and they're typically just used for uplinks. That's really it, they run one gig. Uh, if you were going up to a distribution closet or something like that, you could use those ports. But yeah, Andrew, shoot me an email, let me know. I'd like to hear how that turns out. I wanna, and it'll help me too in future streams if somebody's having the same problem, we can help them out as well. So not to make you the guinea pig, but information sharing is a great thing and that's really what this is for, so. Okay, but that's what port module two is for. And if you look at it, show interface E one by two by one, um, you can see it's just a gig giggy one gigabit um, ethernet port typically use them for uplinks um, but yeah that's really what they're for the reason we use 131 is because they're 10 gig ports uh, so you get basically 20 gigs of um, port density between your stacks so all of the traffic that's going between I mean a lot of things that happen at layer two they're broadcast domains right so you have so much traffic going back and forth between them and now this is basically becoming your backplane. So you have a 20 gigabyte backplane that's screaming back and forth between the two devices to give you all that bandwidth that you really need. So now there's two things in making te tech sense. You probably know most of this, so this is more uh, review than anything, but there are times where you need to get access to the second unit in the stack. Most of the time that's gonna be because support needs information from it, or you need to look at something specific. Well, you can. So when we look at our unit IDs, right, we know that we have two, we have one and two. We're, if we are SSH to this or in the console or whatever, we're going to be connected to the active controller and that's unit one. Well, I need to jump into two and take a look at it. So we're gonna do our console and then you just do the unit ID two. Right there, you're on the CLI of the second device. What can you do from here? Uh, not as much. I mean, you can do some debugs, you can do some CPU commands. Like I said, a lot of this really comes down to, um, ah, get me out of here. There we go. Debug type stuff. So if you have an issue that you think might be one of your devices in the stack, you can get into that level. Um, another thing I wanna show you, this is a handy little trick. Uh, you can type skip. Now if I do a show run, it's gonna skip all the mores. But if you wanna go back to that, you just type page. And now when I do it, it goes back to allowing me to say more. Just different tricks you pick up over time. Now, you can unconfigure some of these units. So you can do stack, unconfigure, me, all clean. You can remove the startup config and reboot to a clean unit. I don't wanna do that. Um, but this will basically revert back to your pre-stacking configuration. So if you need to go back to what that was before in all of your units, because what happens, even if there's a configuration on the second unit, it doesn't care. It's gonna erase that config and push the stacking config down to it. Well, you need to recover that. You just do a stack unconfigure the unit ID, or in this case, I'm gonna do all, and it's gonna dismantle the entire thing. The second unit is now being told you're no longer unit two, it's gonna reboot, it's gonna go back to unit one, it's gonna pull its pre-stack configuration, boom, it's done. Okay, and there might be, um, yeah, you don't really get any remnants left over in your stacking, in the configuration. So it's pretty slick, makes it easy. Okay. That's, uh, that's what I had planned for today. Do you guys have any more questions? <laughs> yeah, I bet you, uh, you learn that command in a hurry, but it's always after you've already done it, right? <laughs> 
Oh, the things we wish we knew two hours ago, right? Awesome. Hey, everybody, I want to thank you all for joining. Uh, like I said, if you have thoughts, suggestions, things you want to see happen on the live stream. Oh, actually, I missed a question. Um, can I send him linked HD device? Oh, yeah, Jason, I think you can send links in here. Uh, it, I don't know if it's restricted or not. Um, if it is, send it to RuckusLive at Comscope.com real quick. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't restrict me, but who knows? We we kind of ratcheted down the filtering on this just so that we didn't end up with anybody um, becoming a bad actor. And that doesn't mean you have permission to test that theory either. Uh, <laughs> um, so a couple things. Since Nightbot isn't working, we do have forums. It's forums.ruckuswireless.com. I provided you with the email address to get a hold of me. It also goes to some of the other instructors internally. We do pay attention to that mailbox. We rely on your feedback, so if you have things you want to see happen in the stream, let me know. Um, we also have a podcast, so I'll tell you a quick funny story. I recorded a podcast last week with with our branding folks because they had uh, they had some interesting things going on when they had three companies come together and they had to do the branding around it. And so we recorded a podcast and I went to publish it on Tuesday, and the recording was corrupted. So. In a massive panic at 7 a.m. on Tuesday, I got the issue resolved and I called one of our instructors, Brian Harkins, and I said, hey, come record a podcast with me because we just got done talking about Wi-Fi speeds and some of the overall confusion with that, um, you know, going through the paces with it. And he did. He came in and Brian's a CWNE, so that's a certified wireless networking expert. He knows he knows his stuff. And so I asked him to come in and record with me, and he did. So the the title of the podcast is Rutcast, and you can find it on Apple, Spotify, um, everything. Any major streaming platform, it's out there. So that's the episode I recorded with Brian. You can access that. You can download it. He gave some really good information. We actually talked about how this came up on the stream, um, but we try to cover different things there. And we also are more than happy to bring people in within the industry and everything else and just talk about this type of technology. So if you have interest, if you want to take part in it, uh, you can email ruckcast at comscope.com. You can email ruckuslive at comscope.com. We'll, we'll pull that in and, and get everything together. So making tech, tech sense, Walter, thank you guys so much. I, uh, I will take that under consideration, Walter. I'd be more than happy to continue the night shows. I, this is, I'm pretty lucky, man. I've got a pretty fun job. I get to do do some podcast stuff. I get to do the live stream stuff. I really enjoy it. Um, I owe you guys an explanation on the roaming piece. I will get that information for you. Um, and we will go from there for sure. So, Jason, shoot me an email if you don't mind just because I'll lose track of it. I am working on putting a Discord together that we can use during the live streams. So if you need to do a screen share or things like that, we can. Um, I just don't want to detract from some of the internal resources we have that are more beneficial. So the forums and things like that. I don't want to take away from that because, you know, the Discord won't grow and it wouldn't have as much visibility to it as, say, the forums would. So I don't want to detract from that. But we can use that during the live streams if we need to. And uh, and we'll go from there. And <laughs> Jason, you're cracking me up. I'm going to actually, next time I'm going to set my NDI camera up in the in the data center over there and I'll show you the rack of hardware I have. And I bet you there's a 7150 in there that you'll want to trade me for. <laughs> so, Hey everybody, I I'm glad you're all here joining. Like I said, I'll take a look at doing this at night again. Um, this is a ton of fun. I love hanging out with you guys. I love doing this and uh, I'm glad that you're all here. You're all safe. You're all healthy. And I know you're dealing with a lot. You've got homeschool and homework and work from home and, you know, there's a lot of confusion and it's a crazy world. So being able to do this is a definite huge benefit. And uh, I can't thank you all enough for coming in. So have a great night. We'll see you next Wednesday, 11 Mountain. Most likely again at 7.30 p.m. Mountain because Walter twisted my arm and it really hurt. So I don't want him to twist the other one. So, all right. Thanks. We'll see everybody.